Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's Dave Dobbs here. It's the, um, it's the 25th of February 2022 and I haven't made a video in um, quite a while and we're two days before a major, um, I can't say a flyby but certainly a major significant day in my flybys comes up. We come to the we're two days away from the, well, we're a day, a day away from the 26th of February. We're two days away from the 27th of February, 2022, um, and which corroborates with, in, in my opinion, with this big pattern that we've been seeing. Um, with the, um, what would it have been? It would have been, if I come to 2010, um, It was the um, the twenty seventh of excuse me the twenty seventh of um, February two thousand and ten and the twenty sixth of February two thousand and ten. So on the twenty sixth of February two thousand and ten, um, we had what I'm calling Kerberos and Sharon, the twins, um, coming coming through. As I'm as I'm of opinion, they're coming through now. And um, and we've seen this, um, we've observed this big 12-year pattern. And these affect us every 12 years, except there's two of them. And the first one came in, like I say, on the um, 26th, 27th, 2000, um, 2000, of February 2010. And then we go one year and 13 days later, and we get, um, we get the same objects coming right round again and causing Fukushima but this time it's the uh, one is Sharon and one is Kerberos I call them those we don't know what their official names at names are I, I name these really because of um, because of Pluto and aspects of um, Pluto's orbits and the journey that we went through um, in through the discovery of Pluto and the subsequent cancelling of Pluto and why they cancelled Pluto and so we come to this we come to we come to um, you know a lot of things have happened since the last video um, I said the um, let's just come up to um, let's let's um, let's just have a look at some of the shots quickly that we're seeing um, this was posted by um, Brandon Corey Nagley on the um, 24th and he's showing some um, he's showing some very interesting shots here So we've got shots like that. That obviously could be could just be the formation of clouds. All of these, but because um, they, but some of them are, um, you know, we're getting all of um, the indications of this, whatever this thing is. Now these could be the formations of storms. Admittedly, they do look like much, some of these look much more like cloud systems than. Um, some of the um, earlier models. He's posted this video as well, actually, um, which were more indications of this same um, this this same thing. He's put them all into an image. They're all included um, in this. They're all included. Um, but the player's gone off, I'm afraid. But they're all included in this um, in this video. And I'm of mind that this is one of the twins. Um, coming in and um, you know it's it's um, lots of people wondering what it is um, you know we um, you know we're just getting all the um, 
meteor you know we're getting we're kind of getting all of the um the kind of all of the activity i imagined we'd um be getting so um i've noticed that um as you've probably been watching the whole ukraine thing's been um really picking up exactly as i said it would you know when i wrote laughing gas my book laughing gas i talked about you know they want to break us out of europe so Europe can be then fed into these free trade deals and thus um, go through this massive process of um, ultimately can be used to, can be fed into a war with um, Russia and ultimately China. And this is what I said in, in Laughing Gas, was just don't leave Europe. And this is why I carried on my whole mission of trying to make you realize that, you know, I mean, leaving Europe was going to be, for Britain leaving Europe was going to be a global um, problem. And um, what this attempts to instigate and what's unfolding now in fear of this system coming in. And so that's where this video is going to be going. It's going to be looking a bit from another perspective of what's really happening now. What's really unfolding right now. You know, this, you know, so many of you have seen my astronomical model and, and, um, and, um, it's funny, I've got a, um, I've got one of my um, life rings out here. Excuse me one second, I'm just going to grab this. Oh. <coughs> Let me... Um, So I can see what I'm doing. I know this is a bit overly sized. Hello. <laughs> but <laughs> I hold that like that. You can imagine that my opinion is what happened on the 26th and the 27th of February 2010 was if that's our solar system, is that if that's our sun, if that's our earth going around our sun, and obviously the sun in the middle somewhere. Um, imagine another object coming in towards our sun and also going around our sun, but it crosses at that angle, or if I more do it, it's at that angle, whilst our Earth is rotating around the sun at that angle. Once it's coming in at that angle and it's slowly leveling out, it's the whole system that what this or ever object this is really orbiting, as it's coming past our sun, it's leveling out and then it's going to have to go the other way. At one time, all these objects are dropping down and coming to it. Suddenly, they're all now level. All the volcanoes are becoming long duration. So you can understand that like that, picture first of all because i haven't incorporated what i call inclination into my model because it's too complicated it's running for too long a period and i haven't got those those type of animations plus i've still been very much at the uh, in the space of just ballpark understanding of their orbits in this new kind of like uh, in this new uh, model that i've been building and it's this inclination that is very different. So when we saw it 10 years ago or 12 years ago, this um, the 2010 flyby, we were experiencing a flyby coming in. It affected Iceland, shut down the air travel with the big volcano on the 26th of February. And on the 27th of February, it was the 8.8 .8 in Chile, north to south in one, and it was over. Now, like I say, when it comes in, you saw this time last year, you saw you know, the Icelandic volcano going bang, um, except it didn't go bang. It was a long duration release. It wasn't a sudden spurt of magma that went up like Etna did about four days ago, seven and a half kilometers into the sky or seven and a half miles into the sky. It spewed out like La Palma did. It, well, it, it, it oozed out like La Palma did. It didn't go, the magma didn't go up into the sky and then 
burn off into carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide and melt all those kind of like all the rest of the kind of silicates into these tiny little beads that get scattered up into the jet stream and cause the mega storms as moisture condenses on those and creates massive rain, which is why volcanoes erupting, big erupting volcanoes. You know, we've just had three named storms and supposedly we're getting the fourth named storm coming in now, but we don't know where it's going to go. All we know is that a major eruption has, has occurred about four days ago, five days ago from in Etna. And you remember we had the previous one about kind of like about 10 days ago. So we knew all those big storms were going to come in. We could absolutely predict that. I'd said that. But the question is, what, what aspect of the cycle is going on? If we can understand that these things are leveling out and all these things are long duration, it was this time last year that also the Congo volcano, it filled with magma, it didn't shoot out the side, it filled with magma and then the caldera walls collapsed, like what happened with La Palma. And um, that was in the Congo. And also Etna did the same thing last year. It filled with, you know, the big... Um, caldera now where the where the magma is coming out of is a different caldera to the one it came out of um, last year because that caldera collapsed and now a whole new caldera has grown to a whole new height you know and in 2018 do you remember where we saw kind of like Kilauea the whole thing leveled itself like the Tonga volcano did it just you know and all of these all of these volcanoes are going bang systematically do you remember i said that the columbia volcano that went bang in 1985 would go bang again and sure enough because it's just above the ecliptic and that's very much affecting this is going to affect europe this is going to affect america this is going to affect um russia this is going to affect all of these aspects above the ecliptic at this stage this isn't going to be coming in so high, I'm of a mind, to kind of potentially, it might do. We, know, we don't know. Maybe it's passed already. Maybe we are ahead of it or now. Maybe, you know, because you can imagine, the reason I wanted to bring down and put this down now, but you can imagine that I'm going to pull my hand here and say, imagine if that was the aspect and I'm holding it like that. That was the aspect that came in 2010 and it crossed. But if I... And we had a, that was the closest aspect in terms of where Earth was going round and where this object was coming down. And when you bring it round like this, you're changing the dynamics of where these things are going to cut in. And so if we're assuming, once we're turning it round and we're assuming that, that point is still the front motion, the, the, the most forward aspect of this system at that point, where we had the earthquake, and that's where Earth was aligning. We, you know, we, we, we are in very, very unknown territory here. We really are. You know, I've just predicted three massive volcanoes. Um, I've predicted a, lot, predicted a lot of volcanoes, but the um, I'm predicting volcanoes quite accurately to within one or two days now, and I've been quite successfully doing that for quite some time, especially since I've been developing... Um, this this new model that that runs from the uh, this currently runs from around about what we're told is the time of Christ, and it shows how in in two six two when there was earthquakes earthquakes um, all across Asia all across Europe um, all across Africa and downfall of the what is effectively the Roman Empire and forced the Roman Empire to kind of jump up a level in terms of the control mechanisms, which was the formation of Christianity, the biggest opposition to what was probably Zoroastrian, the first monotheology before Christianity, supposedly. And, um, and the great threat to the Greeks and the Romans uh, considered, and, and so it seems like the Roman Empire jumped up a level and became the Roman Catholic Church after this. And notice you'll see that we are just getting further and further away from this until we get to about a thousand years after Christ and now we're going to start slowly tracking back and we come to um, Galileo's time and we go 84 years later and we come to Isaac Newton's time and then we go 84 years later and we come to you know the discovery of, of Uranus then we're going 84 years later about to kind of like Pluto uh, sorry to Neptune and then 84 years later to um, to Pluto and then we see this 12-year kind of pattern 
where we see the biggest earthquakes, the biggest tsunami, um, well, the big, certainly the biggest earthquakes, the biggest flooding, where we keep going around. We get all the big, whenever, you know, if there's a, if there's a nuclear power station in operation like there was around about this time, we see nuclear power stations go bang. The biggest storms, the big, you know, 21, 22, 25,000 people potentially dying from the last eruption of that, of the volcano in Colombia that's just gone off because of the mud flood it caused because of all the ice on the top. So hopefully they're, they're forewarned and forearmed for that situation. And that's all this is about. We don't know what's going to happen. You know, this was, um, this was um, the Comet Haley Bop. We were calling it Comet Haley Bop and we were seeing incredible storms. And we start seeing how this... Um, now we start bringing all of the different objects that are coming in off, off this when we're really close to it. And, um, and how I've built this model. But... One thing I'd really like you to see more than anything else in this is remembering that all of these objects are effectively moving forward. Planet X is moving forward. Our sun is moving forward. You know, all your pivotal kind of like um, astronomical discoveries from kind of like Galileo's Jupiter to, to Isaac Newton to kind of like uh, to William Herschel to kind of Neptune to yeah, Neptune, Pluto and that sort of stuff. And then even this time here where, you know, where Isaac Newton, oh, sorry, um, um, Einstein was looking at the sun and from the perspective of um, not being able to see the, looking at the sun during a total solar eclipse or rather not looking at the sun during a total solar eclipse and seeing what was beyond the shining glare and the planets weren't in the positions that they were supposed to be in and so this is what triggered his kind of understanding of the theory, general theory of relativity and to suggest why the planets weren't behind the sun as they were supposed to be and so he was of a mind that the sun was um, drawing, drawing the light towards it bending the lights, so, so, so to speak, and, and, and removing all the positions, which led him to this understanding that actually um, I don't know if you've seen those patterns uh, where people show you the kind of like the, the, the flower of life kind of esque pattern of Mercury as it changes its perihelion point each year you have to remember, I've got the, I've got planet X. This is the, this is our sun here. This is planet X, and this uh, this is what Pluto. You know, I'm just kind of running these lines with this, just to give you an idea, to constantly give you an idea that all of these objects, their angle of intention is moving forward. They're not locked into a closed orbit, as it would seem, around planet X. They're actually locked into a closed orbit around. The Milky Way. This is locked into a closed orbit, meaning it's it's constantly orbiting the Milky Way. It's trapped in that orbit, but it also shares a orbital relationship with these other Pluto and the Sun. So they're all locked into this. Um, they're all locked into this orbital relationship. But it's not exactly the type of orbital relationship that Kepler was describing when he was describing the three rules of thermodynamics mm. back in um, back in um, round about just before Galileo. You know, he was, and then Isaac Newton was kind of updating, really. Um, Isaac Newton was um, updating. Kepler's third rule by saying, well, look, if we add density, because you're not adding density to that, you're adding all these orbital relationships. But what about the fact that the more denser the object is, as well as its speed, it is go it, and the density of the object it orbits is all going to be um, a variation to the... Um, 
the, 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 the manner in which an object orbits something else. And um, it's going to change all the, it's, you know, you change the density, it's going to change everything else. You know, you up the density and down the density, none of those orbits are going to be the same. And this is what really, this is what Isaac Newton brought to Kepler's rules, really, just density. You know, and we just, we tagged it as he's discovered gravity and blah, blah, blah. But you have to kind of think, well, what was he observing? that was outside of the normal, that he was making all these calculations. You see, if we come back to Isaac Newton, who was basically trying to tell us that why we couldn't see the things that were supposed to be behind the sun was because the sun was pulling the, the light in, but it was also saying, well, then not where they're supposed to be with, this, with our current Copernicus standard model that has been going for more than 500 years and this other pattern that we are clearly seeing. So, we can see how all of these people, you know, him constantly moving, the him coming up with this model where he moves the perihelion point. As in, we think about our experience of what happened on the 20th of January, 1606, where we had the tsunami in, um, It, well, in, in the West Country here, massive tsunami in the West Country here uh, on the 20th of January, 1606. And then Carlos Ferrado, the massive earthquake that would happen in, um, that is, um, well, it would have, the, that would have been 1606 there, um, Galileo's time. But then we come back to here and um, on the 20th of January, 1939, um, we're very close to the system. This is when Carlos Ferrada predicts his big crossing of planet X and predicts the big earthquake on the 20th of January, 1939. And so the big prediction that put me on the map, um, which was, um, if I come to the, if I come to the 20th of um, 2017, well, that was the one where I turned up in America on the day because we, we made the big conference on the day of the big flyby in on the 17th of August 2017. I turned up in America for that flyby. We saw it on both sides of the Atlantic. The ESO obviously released a big message saying that two neutron stars had collided 230 million years, light years away, which was which was what caused the the gravitational anomaly and the and the what was it, it was infrared radiation that was also received all at the same time and um, yet we saw the flyby and it was obviously um, going backwards here um, then I'd made that video I'd said um, I'd, I'd said look out for it you're gonna see it on the um, 28th 29th of March and Becky Lewis caught it there and that was when I was using a much older model so I was only seeing one aspect or one side of the orbit so I was only calculating one side and what was happening over this side I was getting completely incorrect um, but this was all before that time, you know, I was still, still pretty much getting all the predictions right. But, um, but that it was that flyby that really put me on the map with this model. It was the biggest, it was the most fantastic, it was so clear. It came with an 8.0 earthquake in Papua New Guinea on the 20th of January 2017, day of Trump's inauguration. So look, we've got, we're, we're much close to that system here. So if I now come back here and I just come back and we just have a little aerial view of this situation. What you'll see here is Pluto's going forward in this direction, whether you want to call it Pluto, whether you want to call it Uranus, whether you want to call it Neptune, you know, whatever you want to call it, you know, this pattern of what we see every 84 years, planet X going in this direction and our sun going in this direction. Can you see how we've got a common, um, common forward direction which means that objects coming in and going out no matter where we are in this system going around anytime we're close to this we've always got a front end in um what looks about 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 june about late june july is the front end if you like it's not going north or south that's not the direction it's going forward on a on a pancake plane and anything that's coming in from these objects, if they're going to come into our sun and go out the other side, they're pretty much, if we're going to, they're, they're going to come from 
if this is over here, they're gonna always, it's always gonna be the same. You know, you've always got the front motion. So you've always got these certain aspects of, of things coming in and going out, which are gonna be consistent. That's why this 20th of January point and, and bigger objects have a slightly bigger orbit come in, in in either January or come in over here before in November. But wherever they're coming in, they're either coming in, they're either coming back, they're either coming right round and looping across here, or they're coming right round and looping across here and coming back out here. You have specific characteristics. You know, this idea that was postulated because of Einstein's theories about Mercury, that Mercury has perpetually changing perihelion point around our sun. So there's our sun here. And something that's coming in and then going out and then coming in and then going out and it's and its perihelion point is constantly changing it implies that our sun has a constantly changing angle of intention its direction is on a hard left bank always it's a preposterous idea it's a preposterous idea to conceal A, a truth and so um, on that thought excuse me one second okay so sorry about that but, um, so if we now come back so we're getting an idea now the reason why this is so important really is the anchors of intention is this is what has been taken away from us more than the deception of the astronomical model that um, has been put over what's really happening and the extent of this massive deception. Um, what it does to us is the very same thing. It takes us away from the place where we truly are and it makes our own angle of intentions very kind of thwarted. And that's the vehicles in which we all fly. Our intentions of what we're trying to bring about on this earth and what subverts that, 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 that those intentions of fulfilling your dreams and not getting lost in stories and attachments that can break you away and why we need to be broken away or why agendas would want to break us away from our intentions excuse me so yeah so sorry about that so yeah so just going back to our angles of intentions because i'm going to try and bring more reference to that you know, to this this whole notion has every type of um, every big discovery. Whether you, it's all a, a kind of alluded to the kind of like direction. You know, as in when I say every every kind of major discovery, this every eighty four years when we invent a big do basically we invent a big blue dwarf planet, is all kind of alluding to the fact or to, to alluding to the um, to um, um, to the real nature of which direction our sun is really moving and ultimately which way we're really moving in the universe and so that's what is that's what this a big part of this whole shamanic process is really trying to conceal to you in this grand deception of keeping our sun the um the center of this rather than not even this object because we could bring this object into the center of, of this but for all of these objects to be holding these spatial distance apart and not kind of collapsing in one way and the other to each other's orbit like when you're riding a bicycle and you stop it's very easy to fall over unless you're really good at balancing and you can you know if you just stay still you're going to fall over unless you're moving and this motion of us all locked into our bigger orbit around the Milky Way is what's enabling all of these other inter-orbital um, relationships that are occurring. And we don't want to make this the center of the, uh, the system. We don't want to make this the center of the system. We don't want to make Pluto, whatever you want to call it, the center of the system. We want to understand, we want to come to the real galactic center of this big system and see how we're all in this much bigger orbital relationship to come back to a galactic perspective. So okay, so let's come back now to some of the um, other sightings. Um, this was um, 
this this has been a very interesting shot. I found this 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 video to be um, very interesting. Just some of the um, this is um, Nibiru Nibiru followers uh, uh, anonymous, and so she and um, and um, well, that's an interesting shot. Some of the effects. Let me just keep moving along. This was a, this was the actual video I was actually looking for. Um, because we're getting lots of the big objects. These, these are not, as far as I know, recent object, recent sightings. Um, you know, we um, we have very often see um, you very often see me post this shot um, taken by Nick Thomas on the 9th of July, two thousand and twenty, um, and but and that was very similar to the very first shot that I got in. Um, on the that really that really got my research for research going when it became so utterly real on the round about the twenty sixth of August two thousand and fifteen, where I really began my my videos for real and I saw the same phenomena. Um, I just, it was just so fantastic, and um, so we're getting kind of similar esque shots coming in and when I of, of this sort of thing now, but it's this big object that I really want to talk about in that I'm going to be. Um, where we're going with this, what this object really is, in, and that's where we're going to start coming to a little bit closer because that's not the object that we are. We are quite close to it. You know, ironically, the place I am on the river here, last flooded in, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm in Bath, and the, the, the specific point, I'm just down from the. Um, From the, I don't know if you can see that big flood defence out there now. Um, you know that whole, you know the bottom section. I don't know how clear that is, but the bottom section of that is basically the top section of that is a big weight, so it's a big pendulum, and that the bottom section raises higher, and that raise that that doesn't exactly it does kind of raise the level of the water, and they've got another one further down that does the same thing. Quite why they've done it. I've got to be honest with you, I still haven't totally um, I still haven't totally worked it out. I just know that where I am now um, in December 2013 the water level came right up and if I if I um, come to if I go to December um, 2013, so you you know you had all my flybys from here um, to here, the big one that put, put Matt Rogers on the map on the 15th of August 2016, where you saw all the debris. Actually, as it going by, you could literally see all the debris of this object, and. Um, and all the, the volcanoes and earthquakes I predicted successfully and well notice Hydra here that's causing the 22nd of November 2016 where Fukushima and Christchurch had their big earthquakes and I'd made the model it wasn't the same as this model because I was successfully predicting all of the objects coming in this side of our Sun I wasn't successfully predicting objects this side because my model just couldn't define it because I was still in a heliocentric model so unless we come out of a heliocentric model, it's very, very, very difficult to get a perception of these. And this is years and years of work. And for so many people, that was one of Dill Martin's last videos there. And it was such a sensational shot coming by. And then, of course, you know, these were all big, um, um, the, the, you know, we're just witnessing all these, all these big flybys. And, um, you know, that's that these were these these objects that are coming in now um, so we go back to 2013 let me just come back to that yet. so that shot there so that was on um, 
on the 23rd of October 2013. You can see the bright object is coming towards us. The tail is behind us. It's coming towards us, being filmed from, like I say, Australia. It was the guy got it two nights in a row. Like, what the hell is that? And then we get the massive storm in December. We can see it coming in. And, um, and then what happens? Um, February 2014, after the flyby. Um, after the flyby, not before the, before the flyby, after the flyby, we see massive NATO investment in, um, in, you know, they had the, they basically had the election in, 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 I think it was Crimea and like 97% of the people had voted to go back to Russia and that the whole thing turned into a skirmish. We were told it was a, it was a, it was, it was not a good election or this whole process. And suddenly the, um, the separatists are massively funded. We're not too sure exactly where the money comes from, but it looks like it was kind of American or NATO kind of led interest, which has led to massive, um, stockpiling of what seems um, weapons coming in from Britain and America and, and a massive NATO build up. And, but that all started after that flyby, after the, the big flood. You know, look at, um, we go back to 2011. Um, so we had, um, we had, you know, we had 11th of March, 2011, Fukushima. One year and 13 days before we have, like I say, the Chile earthquake and the, um, and the big Iceland volcano, a day apart, north, south. Um, and then w one year and 13 days after that, we get Fukushima. Um, which is ironically occurring right at the true perihelion point of what we're told is that day would be the perihelion point of Jupiter, supposedly closest to our, um, our sun. You know, and so we can see there's a Jupiter-esque mechanics in all of this. Um, so that's, that's the 11th of March 2011, and by the 20th, 24th, NATO is bombing after the flyby. NATO is going to war with Libya, dragging all of the NATO countries in an alliance to um, do a massive invasion of, um, of Libya. Come say hello. Say hello. Who's that little doggy here? It's Shanti. Excuse the state of the place in here. I've just not been able to make any videos. I've been going through. Um, I've been going through a major. I went. I went through COVID at the um, um, early on in the month. And do you remember around about the seventh? I'm not too sure of the exact dates here. We'll probably get to it as we as as we um, as we come up to the uh, the the alignment of this. You know, everything's been happening. Um, let me just come back to the. Let me just come back to. Um, 450 Russian troops killed in Ukraine. That was this news story yesterday. Let's try and move on from that. And um, yeah, so that was the 21st of, of Feb. So that's the second major eruption. Do you remember the first major eruption was about a week, 10 days before, and now it's just, that was on the 21st, so that was three days ago. Um, and then um, the eruption of Nevada, Del Ruiz, Volcano, that was Columbia in 1995. That's the one that killed 21,000. I'd said in my last video almost a month ago now, I said, you know, this is going to get, this has to go bang at this point. And um, um, explosion continues. Um, Columbia's Nevada, Del Ruiz, Volcano activity explosion again. Um, I'm just going to bring that over to here because I've just seen my battery light coming on because we're using a lot of power. So I'm just going to switch that across. I bring it over here. Okay. There we go. We're back on the um, back on the battery power. Um, so that so that volcano went it went bang exactly when we when we were expecting it. The um, Ukrainian kind of side, you know, the the Russians have kind of we don't well. It looks like they're being drawn into this or just, you know, this thing is unfolding. And, um, 
and you know Biden doesn't want to move into this directly. He wants to supply the weapons and everything else like that, but he doesn't want to directly engage. Um, he wants to take America from a state of perpetual war into a state of perpetual diplomacy. Noticing that we're seeing Kilauea um, volcano. You remember the last time it went really bang was on the fourth May the fourth, two thousand and eighteen, and it was the first of the long duration volcanoes we've seen since since the Second World War. So we know there's something big affecting us now in a very different way that we've seen for a very long time. The last time before that was um, was Isaac Newton's time, and the last time before that was Galileo's time. But even now, you know, the the certainly. Um, these are these you know these are very unusual long duration volcanoes. Anyway, the caldera is is full now. It's pretty much full to the top, but it's calm. It's like something is there and it's constantly pulling on the magma. All these magma chambers are going to be reaching their fullest, um, their fullest right now. And we don't know whether or not we just don't know what to expect. All I can all I can say is that by all my mathematics, all this time it's going to be very very unlikely we don't see. Um, some long duration volcanoes going bang, and they're not so they're not so dangerous. I mean, obviously, magma coming down the side of 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 of, of volcanoes and going into towns and cities. But it, you know, it's not going into the air. It's not it's not blocking up the sky. You know, if you're living below a volcano and if you're in long, you know, there's no such thing as a dormant volcano. There's no such uh, the idea that suddenly that you've got extinct volcanoes, should I say? You know that like there's somehow the magma is no longer underneath the up deep underneath the ground like it was before it's just a crazy crazy notion so if you're living on or around a volcano um you gotta be concerned it's just like there you know that it's it's real estate people that have have sold us this idea of safe volcanoes it's like giving someone a gun and saying it's safe um because it hasn't been cocked, um, whatever you call it, you know, it's, um, it's, um, I'm going to have to take this doggy out for a, um, to use the loo, and then I shall be straight back, and uh, we're, so I think we've just got up to, the, basically, that we are seeing the type of volcanic activity, and, um, and then we're going to talk about, when I come back, we're going to talk about these, um, these, what do you call it? Um, the asteroids that we we saw on um, on the around about the 9th of Feb. So we're going to be dis discussing that and where are they really SpaceX um, satellites or where are they asteroids? And was you know this came with nine eruptions of Kilauea, didn't it? On the not Kilauea, um, Krakatau at the same time went off nine times in a row, all about the same time. So that's what we're coming back to straight after I get back. Hold on. Okay, sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. That was a bit of a, um, um, that was a bit of a, just, you know, I'm just kind of. <sighs> anyway, so we saw that. We saw this shot coming in on, um, on, on, um, the 9th of, um, around about the 9th of February, 2020. Lots of people seem to, seem to catch it. And I just thought it was quite interesting because we had so many shots, um, this time last year of um yeah, I've got that there maybe that's not the um you know you'll see lots and lot that's 24th of march 2021 we saw a very similar kind of thing and you'll see not just around that date but um not just on that date but you'll see lots and lots of very similar um Fireball meteorite that blazed across the UK. Um, what was that? That was day uh, March the 9th. Landed in someone's um, garden or on their drive. Um, and then you know, there's lots and lots around this time. But it was in. It was you know, it was starting in March and going through till. So th that was quite interesting. That um, what date was that? That was March the first. Hundreds of people across UK, Ireland caught a rare glimpse of a large meteorite streaking through the sky on Sunday night. There's just lots and lots and lots of big, amazing shots of um, 
of this of 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 this object. Um, this I found quite interesting from um, um, Nibiru Action. Um, this was on he posted this on the seventh of Feb. Um, he really got some amazing shots. We're seeing so many shots of this, and he he captures it. So, but it's a very very interesting time to get to get um, shots of this because you've got to be in the right place. But I'm of mind that this is the this is none of the twin tail objects. This is the big object that um, whether you want to whatever you want to call it, Jupiter, whatever you want to call it. This is that specific object, and we are going to. Um, I see another another shot there, like seven days ago. Very similar. He gets he gets this a lot. He's very very good. He puts a lot of research. Um, one month ago, you're seeing it there, and you're seeing, you know, he, he's um, he's he's amazing at getting these, at getting the um, at getting these shots. Um, very often from you know many you can say are light refractions and um, and. And the and, and the likes, but there's just so many um, there's just so many shots of um, of this object. You know, we've just got I've just I can just show you thousands, <laughs> literally. You know, it's just it's it's just fantastic. And I'm in after all of these years of observing this, I'm finally getting my head around this idea that this object is indeed also coming in from the Pluto system. It's orbiting this, whether you want to call it the Pluto system, and um, coming in towards our sun. It hasn't always done that. It's doing it at the moment, and it's going right around our sun, and it's causing, it's been causing massive, um, seismology, volcanoes, all the rest of it, you know, and um, like I say, I'm of a mind to cause the, the um, Boxing Day earthquake. Uh, volcanoes that caused the tsunami on, on in 2004, Boxing Day on 26 of December um, 2004, and then it would take eight years. Um, I'd have to probably that's the best if I come to 2004, where this model actually starts at this point. Um, see Hydra here coming in and going across there. We're right next to it. Now notice at this point over here, it's crossing here, straight after, but we're over here. So we'd have to go to the 2008 Sichuan earthquake to be coming round and experiencing that crossing, which is now all the big earthquakes, we'd have to go around a full cycle of that again to come to 2000 and, um, apologies, I went too quickly there, to 2022. And notice where our Earth is coming here, and you know this is where is um, Hydra? I've done that right. See, the, when I built this model, I was of a mind that um, you know I just didn't know what the exit passage what was going to be over here, whether it was going to come out here, or whether it was going to come much closer to the sun and go out here. And what we're realizing is that it's coming out of here. So much of these, you know, much of these angles, obviously, you know, these are all, they're all guesstimates. They're all just based on sighting after sighting after sighting of all the many, many sightings that we have and trying to bring them all together so we can have, we can make sense of them. And this is the, this model, this kind of line of inquiry has been my attempt to try and make sense and break these part, these sightings apart to give us a higher view of, and a greater understanding for me of the mechanics behind the messages that I was given that first of all enabled me to um, to write that book, Laughing Gas, where you know um, Joy Dobbs in this nitrous fueled quest is it quest? Um, yeah, quest to um, find the only thing he believes can stop the ap uh, the apocalyptic showdown which haunts him after a blast of laughing gas. Um, and it says, just because you are your final destination um, doesn't mean it's not going to be a bumpy ride. And that's what 
really the fundamental me fundamental message I've been getting through all of this, and that's really what I'm trying to you know excuse the quick astronomical kind of like uh, breakdown. I can't do much more than that this time, and it's probably not the it's probably not the um, You know, I, you know, then now we're just at that point where we just don't know what to expect. Certainly, we've just had three named storms. Um, I, the reason I brought you up to, um, um, I showed you the flybys in um, the the asteroids in in that we saw. You know, they're telling us are the uh, SpaceX satellites, which maybe they are, but we have these two for sure coming in. And we also have what you can't see here. Have I got it in this model? See Europa going out here and going out the other way. So we are trying to desperately calculate um, Europa's final, you know, the one that doesn't actually come in, the one that gets very close. It's the innermost orbiting object of, if you like, the Pluto system. It comes in, but it doesn't, the whole system is close to us, but it doesn't get close enough to us. For it to be drawn into our sun but it comes in and it goes out the other side and I often talk about kind of like Alex Lupin shot that he posted that was from a Mexico from a webcams to Mexico shot and if I do come come come, come by in the, I'll show you that shot but um how we see the object I said look out for it on the 1st of September around about the 1st of September 2019 and we've seen it over here on the 20th of Maybe it was the 3rd of July, 2019. 3rd or the 20th of July, I think I'm getting confused. I think it was the 3rd of July, 2020, 2019, sorry. So we'd seen it coming in. Alex Lucan again had got it on one of his shots. And then I said, look out for it. And sure enough, you'd seen it going out here. But as I often talk about, I was imagining that we'd see it coming, if you like, coming in over here and coming out here. But... And that's when I was still grappling with the idea of our sun being somehow in the center, even though I was doing all, I was massively exploring with Universe Sandbox. You know, many people have been telling me, you've really got to get to grips with that package and start playing with your own orbital mechanics a little bit more and seeing these models, playing them out. And I was always, I, I was using Flash and various different things to kind of like capture these models and these capture these ideas. And when we'd seen that and we'd seen the whole, arc of the tail we'd seen the object but the object was clearly coming in here not going around our sun at all and orbiting clearly something over here it was the final piece in the not not the final piece in the puzzle but the biggest thing that enabled me to um start building this this new model and coming out of a heliocentric model it was the final piece of evidence that i needed to kind of take that big jump within my own mind and had all this apparatus to start experimenting with what possible orbits could exist outside using all this data outside of a of this model of this heliocentric 500 year old copernicus model that we've been in for so long you know can you imagine that you know with our sun constantly moving this forward direction you see you see venus here and you see mercury can you imagine if mercury's perihelion point you know in one year is there that's its closest point and the sun's moving this way so when it's coming back round it's going further in reality around here and then spinning around and that's the perihelion point of mercury and its frontal point you can you imagine and then to suggest the next year or however long it's going to move a month and the next year it's going to move a month and the perihelion point is going to be changing the only way that could be changing is if the sun is changing direction constantly as well you God, we have our sun. None of these things make any sense from an astronomical astronomical perspective. And yet uh, the science that we're in, the Newtonian science that we're in, asks us to completely keep changing the perihelion point of various planets orbiting our sun, which kind of gives our sun a very confused kind of like, which way is it going? This is the big problem that we're having at the moment. And this quest into this journey that um, I turned into this book, this journey in South America that was this quest to try and find out what the hell is going on on our planet and being told via, via, via an ayahuasca ceremony that we no, our planet will no longer support duality and the unfolding of this message 
and it's unfolding that we approach a massive wall and nothing gets beyond this planet that is nothing gets beyond this wall that is of war and how great powers have if they can use this great power to their advantage i.e. nothing gets past this system that is of war and to make your enemies wage war at the critical times when you absolutely cannot wage war then even though you might not own this technology you can see how you can get your enemies to go to come and invade you at this time and go on the invasive at a time when this thing's flying by and have catastrophic catastrophic effects as I often talk about, you know, Sir Francis Drake, master and commander of the, of the fleet, playing bowls as the biggest fleet to ever set sail is coming towards him. So we seem to have all the superior firepower in this. And we seem to be at a position where we are, um, we have, NATO seems to be on the, on the technological um front line here but um but you know china's got what one aircraft carrier but one high-tech aircraft carrier that's apparently got lots of problems at the moment but you know what happened in the second world war you know um america put all its fleet into pearl harbor in 19 about 42 43 and japan thought oh look they've put all of their fleet in pearl harbor they've completely put themselves in the most vulnerable position they've taken all of their fleet out of battleship formation out of a defensive strategic formation that made it very difficult and it left them very susceptible to the fire ships and then this great storm that came in um, sorry, I'm, talking, I'm getting my stories mixed up there. Um, it, you know, we'd learnt this lesson in the days of the Spanish Inquisition, where all the ships had been taken out of battle formation off the coast of um, off the coast of Belgium, ready to kind of ferry all of the troops that were waiting to be ferried across into what was going to become the battlefield if the Spanish Inquisition had gone full head and those those ships had landed in Britain. Of course, they never did. A miracle stuck came in and that was that's the inspiration of the first play in the in shakespeare's works the tempest you know about the great the great storm that um that prospero controls with the boding spirit um that he has control over supposedly ariel you know it's the same story don't eat my book you little rascal and um and so we can see how the same thing, that's why I knew that this whole kind of like thing with Ukraine was going to play out now. And we can see how it played out before, how all these bits are put into position, how different strategic forces around the world try to entice with, with this information, um, how, to, um, how, to, how to make your enemies go under the wheels of their, of their own gods unwittingly. Um, and so I want to talk about now um, about a more complicated aspect of what's unfolding to try and give you a bit of a picture because laughing gas for me as much as anything else was, was going off. You know, I've turned this whole thing into a book and, and um, it's based on a true story, but I can't say it's a true story to work to work because it's, it's it's truly been adapted massively and because it was such an interesting um, outrageous journey i had to kind of chop and change massive aspects of the stories and bring different aspects in to to protect different identities and and what have you so i i i i moved lots of different stories around to make this story possible um and to um, change lots of interesting dynamics and intersperse, intersperse kind of like different aspects of different stories to um, so it, it's based on a true story and it, it is well the visions certainly are what, what exactly as I experienced them but much of the book has been changed around and different aspects of my life brought in to kind of 
to accommodate um, the complexity of the situations um, that were kind of playing out. Um, but I was, I had to go for a whole death experience. You know, after, after, after all this whole experience, I had to go up to the mountains and relearn to do all the things that I was doing with ayahuasca without any ayahuasca. I get up at five o'clock in the morning and learn to access my dream space. And so I could start opening the same doors that I was opening with ayahuasca, except that I had the confirmation that I had that, that there was going to be um, that this work was going to be that I had work to do, and this was this was what I was going to have to do was unlock this, and also learn to rise above my ego, rise above the interference of my signal coming in, and go to a place where I could not tear that information apart and work with this information and work with my highest aspects and then not feed it straight back to my ego and my doubt that would tear that information apart and make it very very difficult for me to contain any of that information so i know i'm going in circles here but i've got a calculator up here and i think somewhere there it is so Um, we're told we don't know we, we just don't know but I, I was living in Hong Kong years ago and I remember being on this ferry and picking up this um, picking up a um, it was a Time magazine story I think it was a Time magazine and it was basically talking about how the world population now is equivalent to all the people that is like 45% of everyone that has ever lived is still alive basically and what that means is that if you take Galileo, Jesus, Muhammad, Moses and everything else like that you know these are hypothetical figures no one knows and the way in which the storylines have been massively changed over the years um, no one's going to know and we don't know so none of this is like we can't say any of this is fact. It's not about fact. It's just about playing with the ideas. And to try and get a bit of a window on what's happening on another perspective. And um, because of what's about to unfold on this planet, what I'm, I'm kind of trying to piece together from all the messages that I've had of what's really happening now from another perspective. So. We're told it's about, the population is about 7 billion going 8. And, um, sorry, my hair's all hanging down. I'm not going to kind of like, um, when I look in the mirror to see which side of my hair's hanging, or look in the screen, I'm going, ah! But um, anyway, I'm a, bit, a little bit rough cut around the edges at the moment. Apologies about that. Um, I do feel as if I'm holding, with my holding on with my fingernails like we all do at the moment. And, um, and I'm not properly firing on all four. I don't think any of us can. It's such a sensational time to be living in. But anyway, so we're told the population of the Earth is going from 7 billion up to about 8 billion, whatever. And, and we're, we're told potentially, you know, we play with these figures, no one truly knows, but they were kind of like saying that potentially 45% of all the people who have ever lived on the planet are still alive today. In other words, there's been a massive population explosion over the last 50, 50 years. And it's caused this massive increase in population. And, you know, we can see how that's come about. We can see in 19, 1850, we discovered guano. We, were told we discovered it, the indigenous, the indigenous in the area, yeah, certainly in Peru, um, had been using it for we don't know how long. But hey, the white man turns up, discovered it, and said, that's ours, we'll take it all. And we took millions of tons, millions of tons um, of. British certainly did um, in you know from from the Peruvian coast fossilized bird shit basically bird poo or whatever and um, and it was full of nitrates and we realised that we could sprinkle it over the fields and produce bumper crops and then when that finally ran out at the end of uh, the nineteenth century at the end of the eighteenth century in the early nineteen hundreds it was um, we we. Um, at the early of the 20th century, 1900, the early, early 20th century, it ran out. And um, that's when we learned to um, make ammonia. 
using massive amounts of energy. And um, and when you think about country, countries like Israel that we see that don't then really export oil, but they do export nitrates, so they convert the oil into nitrates and then export the nitrates, um, which are worth much more money. Weapons, they go bang as well. So they make amazing bombs and they make the population go into super zone. Every field could be turned into bumper crop production just with a little sprinkle of not guano anymore, but fossilized, fossilized, um, engineered um, nitrous based fertilizers. And we can see how we've pushed the massive, we've pushed this population explosion on this planet. And why? Let's think about, so we got, we could say that, you know, I don't know where you're at with this, but let's just assume that there are pop that, that, you know, I, I, you know, if everyone, there's a benchmark of where you and how you see this. I'm just trying to offer a bit of a window on a perspective of looking at this. It's not correct. It's not incorrect. It's not right, wrong. It's just a window, a window on it. You know, you can steer it any which way you like, depending on where you, where you pick yourself and where you're kind of like, where, where, where you open yourself and, and what you can allow to exist in the field and how much you can ask these questions. And, you know, we don't know the answers to this but I'm just trying to open this from a perspective of thought but you know if that would you know 45% of all the people that have ever lived on the planet that would give a total of all the people who have ever lived would be a bit more than about 55 but 55 and we're we're suggesting it's about seven and a half billion people living on, on the planet seven seven and a half billion so let's round that off and say 15 billion people have ever lived on the planet Jesus, Moses, you, me, everyone. You know, I'm not trying to suggest that's correct. I think that the whole history line has been massively played with. It's much more complex and convoluted than we can ever conceive right now. But as a window, as a window on all of it. Now, if every, I don't know where you stand in terms of the stories of reincarnation, but... Um, you know, that basically, with those sort of figures, that means if you believed in reincarnation, that kind of figure means that potentially every person who's ever lived on this planet, if they only had one life, if they only have ever lived one life before and there was no reincarnation, then that kind of figure would kind of make sense. If they were all here again and they'd all had one life and they were all suddenly born back on, on this planet again and all that all the other, all the existing human beings, the souls that had incarnated in those human beings had only all had one life each. And this, this all makes sense, doesn't it? They all lived once before, they all had one soul and suddenly they're all here again. There's no reincarnation apart from they are just all suddenly here again. And they've had one reincarnation and this is it. You know, can you imagine the 7 million people had existed in total of all history as we could understand human impact on this planet from this current window, this current perspective, and suddenly all being here now. Um, one, one, one life in the past, one life in the future. But if you were to say they'd had um, 10 lives, and so we've got, um, what would it be? Seven, one, two, seven thousand million, which I think is seven billion, seven thousand one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven billion, I believe. So if we divided that by ten, we come to um, one, two, three, four, five, six. So seven hundred. Um, 700 million um, that's that's getting closer to the size of you know not a billion but it's getting closer to the size of the population of India or or um, or China, not even as big. You know, if 
we were to assume that all of those um, if we were to assume that they'd had 10 lives and we were to divide that down how many souls there would be present if you put all those souls together at one time and they all had 10 lives each until you divided that by 10 so um, let's go back to 7 1 1 2 3 and then 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 billion again um, I think we can do memory plus on that memory cancel memory plus maybe that will uh, so let's see if that captures it, it might not but um one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six. Divide it, so that's seven billion divided by, now we're going to do a hundred. And that is um, 70 million. That is the size of the population of Britain. If all the souls were present, had ever lived on the planet, and they'd all had a hundred lives each, given the kind of population that we're looking at, and we were to divide that down, that would give us all the souls were present at one time we would have 70 million souls that could only be here at any one time if they were all here together that makes it kind of like i know, I know this we're just playing with the figures here i'm just trying to give you a window on another window to look at what's going going on so now I'm going to see if that does a memory recall which it doesn't so I don't know how to use the memory recall memory recall let me recall. No, it doesn't seem to let me do that. Okay, so um, we're going to go 7, 1, 2, 3, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we're back to 7 billion divided by 1,000 now. 1, 0, 0, 0. And we come to um, 7 million. Yeah, 7 million. If we'd all had a thousand lives each, and we come to the size of that's the size of probably around about the population of London, probably, or well, certainly probably about the population size of Hong Kong. I imagine probably London might be even bigger. But you know, we're talking about the size of a big city if all the souls were present. And yet, what we see is what we are seeing is the massive population that exists on the planet doesn't give us it's if, if we've had many people that have reincarnated on this earth many times and they're all present together we can only have like I say if it was that if we had a thousand lives each if it was thousands you know if we put another if we if we've made that ten thousand I don't know what the figures are I don't know what you know we've got no window on this because when we incarnate on this earth all our soul history is cut off from us we don't know it was like we come here to recreate ourselves if you like anew and so we end up with these kind of unknown quantities but we're just playing with this idea because imagine that all of there's many new souls that are coming here so picture from my perspective when i'm talking about in this message that i'm told that humanity isn't choosing a side it's choosing a soul and that each human is ultimately choosing which soul will ultimately reside through it, whether it be its highest asp aspect or its ego asp aspect, is entirely the human choice. And we all have to go ultimately and decide which frequency we want to operate on. This is why, you know, when Carlos Rada's prediction came by in 1939, we'd come past Pluto and then we were coming out to this point where all these planets were finally leveling out, you know, 1944 when Vesuvius was going on going bang, all the biggest volcanoes were going bang in and around the last time when they were going long duration was around the Second World War, that same crossing point that we're in now where all the things reach out, come out to Earth and they're on the same level, the same eclectic plane so they can reach right out and come out and cross the orbital track of Earth going around our Sun. They can cross that same point, that's what we're experiencing now. So when you're kind of like thinking about what happens where if we would get a similar event like the Carrington event, 1859, around about August again, where we get this mass, every electrical pylon falls over, everything that's conducting electricity just melts, um, people die in machinery, get electrocuted, all sorts of things. And 
you know, we're told it's a grand solar flare that caused this whole process, but imagine if it was a planetary crossing. And imagine if they know this is going to come in. Imagine what this would do to what we don't bring into this and we can't see or perceive here is our astral realms. The astral realms that are connected to this planet. Imagine if all those get shut down because of the same astrological event that's occurring and all the realms associated built from this world. Now we are, as I'm understanding it, humanity is plagued. It's plagued by astral interference that is drawing us into a lower space so that we create in these lower astral realms. When we create in love and we create in higher realms, when we can be taken into lower vibration activity, we can be used to build in and manifest lower vibrational realms. And that's what I have been under led to understand through my process is what comes into the spotlight here. These realms are about to get shut down and they'll start rebuilding again after this massive process. Or the greatest invasion to this planet, the unseen invasion to this planet that we're not seeing is the invasion of our fourth dimensional astral realms. Where we go to and fro between lives. It's not our ultimate place, but we, we go through to these, you know, these are the realms that we are creating with. This is, this is what comes with the life to earth, is the astral realms that are attached to it. And they're not the same type of karmic realms that exist on, that this earth exists in this third dimension. You know, everyone wants to come here so they can manifest into a higher space. But the karmic, this is a karmic realm and many beings are terrified to come here because of the karmic repercussions. They, you know, many want to just exist in like the heavenly realms, the equivalent of heavenly realms, but not on the highest vibration. But the next best thing to the heavenly realms are the astral realms that are connected to this earth because they're non-karmic realms. And imagine having your dream realms, your astral realms invaded because of various different types of trauma and various different techniques can be used to access humanity's astral realms and that those realms have been invaded. Now what happens if those realms get shut down? Where does everyone go? Where do all the beings go that have invaded those astral realms? Where do they go? Where would you want to bring those beings that have existed within and been parasites to Earth's astral um, multiverse that is connected to the, this third dimensional world. And if you start seeing a tiny window on what really is unfolding there and the different intentions that are coming through humanity. You know, they're all different intentions depending on the story that each individual human being is tied into and the frequency that the human being is operating on depends on what story and what narrative there. You know, we all have an underlying, if you like, soul intention that we tune into. Sometimes we tune into ego soul invention intentions. And sometimes we choose into we we tap into that highest aspect, the true residing heart center soul and its intentions and we get, we're like a rabbit in the headlights except it's kind of two headlights, two identities, two soul identities and we kind of go in between the two and sometimes we go high and sometimes we go low and we bound between the two depending on our moods, our influences and what's coming at us and what we're trying to, you know, that's what we need to focus on intentions and where we're going, our angle of intention. And so it was all coming back to 
all comes back to our intentions and the frequencies that we're choosing to to operate on and a door opens for humanity here because as this astral realm comes to its final conclusion ready for a complete restart it's going to go through this massive you know what this 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 we want to call it a plasma plasma charge like we saw on the 14th of october 2016 the jeff peak classic shot that i showed in so many of my shots um have i got it in um probably um probably i need to go back to yeah, where we see it coming around, getting closer and closer, and then we start leveling out, and we suddenly the main Jupiter object we see doing the plasma charge. And we know this was, I've done enough research of this to know that this was the camera was facing northeast at night, about 10 o'clock at night, exactly looking at exactly where Mars was at the time. You can see Mars is just coming around there, and we get this shot. Except that what I'm realizing now is that Jupiter, whatever you want to call it, this big blue object that orbits this other object over here that we can call Pluto, came in and didn't go around like that. It, it was coming in towards our sun and it came around our sun and came out the other side. And we can see the evidence of, you know, we saw the 22nd of November. 2016 I made the model I was it was a different model to this because I was still operating on a heliocentric model that I has a sun was in the center but you know it's um, it was one, it was caught on a webcam it was one of the most sensational shot and it could corroborate with so many other shots there it is in all its glory we just can't believe it because this is the nature of in fact of the invasion of humanity belief is the mechanism which has controlled us for so long to stop to blind us from this mighty pattern that has been going on since Carlos Ferrada's time. And then we go back considerably further, you know, to, to, um, to, you know, to 1846, what, 1846 was obviously Neptune, but 1859 was the counting of it. And so we see, you know, what comes in must go out. So we can assume there's going to be this same kind of, this big same plasma process, not happening between Mars and this object but happening between Earth and this object. We've just got too much evidence of it. I've just had too many fantastic shots of it. You know, we've just... We've... Um, we've just had too many fantastic shots of it over, over, over the days of, of the fantasticness of, um, of these epic shots. And... We're just trying to find a window. We're just trying to bring all this together into a window. And so the uncomfortable thing about this is that this earth is full of beings at different stages in human evolution and different stages in soul evolution. And that is not going to change. You know, there's always going to be grand masters coming in here that have mastery in different aspects of different levels of existence, whether it be, you know, whether it be kind of like physical, whether it be, you know, psychological, whether it be metaphysical, whether it be totally spiritual, astral, whether it be your, your connections to way beyond this, you know, galactic kind of like our connections and all the rest of it, we're all going to come and we're all going to be at different levels of evolution in different aspects of, of, of the varied holistic whole of what it is to be a living being, a living, breathing being on this planet. And that will not change. There's always going to be various different levels. But what's unfolding here is the doorway is opening to a higher like a doorway to when we level out when all these objects like they did in Galileo's time like they did in 
was it Newton's time? No, they did in William Herschel's time. No, they did at the time of, you know, when Neptune, uh, Neptune was more than one astronomer, and same with kind of like around the time of Pluto, and, you know, and and um, and, my, and and Mike Brown coming up with the ideas of Eris and changing all the perihelion points, like um, like Isaac, Newton, like um, Einstein, you know, to, to accommodate this whole big bullshit to perpetuate this Copernicus model and perpetuate this deception where you don't know the angle of your attention within the great system. You know where you're going. It, it's, you know, none of these, you can't make any of my planetary kind of like uh, flybys work if you do not give a consistent angle of intention to all the, all the primary three main players within that. If you do not give them common angle of intention, whole thing falls apart, the whole thing falls apart, everything. The only way you're going to make that is bringing in a fourth rule of orbital mechanics on top of Kepler's third rule. And not just to add kind of like Neptune's or, 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 or Isaac Newton's kind of just bringing density to the third rule. And yeah, we can work it all out there. We need to understand that when something reaches big enough density, it can change its orbital center of gravity and link to a higher orbital mass also. And it, it's changing, you know, we can, you know, I often talk about kind of like um, um, Dr. Claudia Orbus. Um, um, she, she's Plan X. You know, she's the one who um, Dr. Um, I think I said that name right. I'm going to try and say it again because I get sometimes a bit confused with names and what have you. But do you know who I mean? Um, I'll try and put her name over the top there. But um, she was the one who gave us his name, Stella Cord. The idea, you know, where you saw the big kind of like what looks like a big sphere coming into the sun and then ducking straight out after it seems to refuel or something. You know, to me, that's a spaceship in a massive kind of ball of um, energetic protection going into the sun to refuel. And it's not like a planet or a sphere. There's something obviously in there being protected in that sphere. And it's going in and refueling from the sun. Um, good story for us to get our head around, but, you know, why wouldn't it? Why would, you know, we're getting all our sun from the energy. Why wouldn't anything else going by? You know what I mean? It's totally logical. You know, we're all surviving off the energy of the sun. That seems to be a no-brainer to me. Um, but anyway, these ideas are stellar cores. Anyway, Dr. Claudia Albus was the... Um, um, she opened my mind with the simplest concept of open and closed orbits. You know, how something is coming in, going out, and it's not coming. 3,600 year orbits and it comes in, it takes 3,000 years, 600 years to come in and then straight out the other side and coming back. 3,600, it's just not feasibly possible that the Jupiter 12 year orbit, well, you know, we just don't know about Jupiter anymore because the orbital mechanics we're seeing exactly mimic Jupiter. You know, it's, we just don't know what we're seeing, we're just questioning the story from top to bottom, but nonetheless, this kind of a notion that. When something comes in, and it's a it's a, it's a closed it's a um, it's a closed orbit, meaning that it comes in and the angle of it comes around whatever its orbit becomes so tight it goes beyond a certain angle that it's guaranteed to come back, and that's a closed orbit. Um, and that's as far as we're kind of going with our basic understanding of orbital mechanics and Kepler's laws, and it's upgrading with kind of like Newtonian kind of like density ideas and everything else like that, we're not taking this to another level with our orbital understandings and with the angle and how many people have really stopped to consider the direction the sun is moving. Most would not be able to get their head around such a notion because it's been absolutely torn apart with all these different big kind of like 84 year discoveries that kind of jump and change the they're all putting these different planets at different perihelion points to the sun, implying that the sun is even completely static. That's 
people are suspicious when the water runs. It means I've got water in someone. When you heard that noise, that means I'm, the water's repressurizing itself, which means I can all leak somewhere. Anyway, I'm going to have to ask one more, and that's going to be one of my um, next grand inquiries of where that water just went, when the pressure disappeared. Everything's a mechanical process on my mind. If something's happening over here, it must be affecting over there. My mind works in that process of work calculating equilibrium all the time. The same thing. That's that's where we're at at the moment, and that's what you know. You know, we we we've got to make the effort to clean up our astronomical models and look at this to kind of get this bigger picture. So what's going to happen now? You know, NATO won't engage in this until after this flyby, and that's what tells me, you know, that the 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 seven or nine eruptions, consecutive eruptions of Krakatoa when about the 7th to the 9th, whichever day it was, of February. Much more implies that it was, the object came in in September and goes out in kind of December, January. You know, what I call, um, what I call, let's just show it so I'm, um, got it on that model I put it on that one so there we go so the object see uh, you're gonna see your um, your rope coming in so come come in again I've just missed it. Oh, I just missed it again there so it, there's so many flybys in here see your rope is coming around here and we're expecting it to go out round about here and it seems that this object might be slightly further back than what I've calculated here but you know, these all these big flybys that I've predicted is when you see them and when they've been coming into view and we've been having this, we had this two-day anomaly right up to 2018 and then when the levelling started out and we saw the killer wave volcanic on the 4th of May 2018, everything massive cha massively changed. As soon as we've reached long-duration volcano sta status, like in the Second World War, like I say, in Galileo's time, in Isaac Newton's time, in William Herschel's time, all as soon as we reach this point where all of these objects are suddenly leveling out and they're coming straight past the sun and we see these long duration volcanoes, everything changed after 2018. Now we're starting to all think, oh, we're seeing the much bigger flybys, we're seeing the much bigger patterns, we're seeing bigger seismology, bigger kind of like, it's all, it's all happening, isn't it? It's all happening. So we don't know exactly what's going to unfold here, but I'm of a mind, I'm much more of a mind that the that the flybys and all the debris that we saw that they were telling us was Elon Musk rockets was all Europa there, and we've still got uh, we're the first twin of the pair to um, to do its 2022 flyby. And this model, you know, I put this model together in 2020. Uh, the beginning of 2020, I believe. So it's coming up to two years old now, and it's um, and no, it's that's this was this is uh, this is uh, this is an old model, you know. It's um, and I've, I, I have to update this a lot, but this is what I'm telling you. And then next year we come to 2023, where next year it's going to be um, it's going to be Sharon. It's going to be the which was Sharon was. You know, Sharon, I believe, was the name that um, Richard, is it Richard, um, Richard, ha Richard Harrington, I can't think of his name, it was Richard, or who was it who came up with um, Pluto's largest moon? Um, Sharon, I think it was. Um, someone might want to correct me on that, but Richard Harrington um, was big influence in, he was, he was in the government, wasn't he? He was the government side. He was the one who kind of like influenced Zachar Sitchin and got him back onto the 3,600 year heliocentric, you know, and um, everyone's trying to control this story one way or another. That's it guys. Um, another video that I just, you know, we, we can kind of see that me that, that after this big flyby, um, maybe it's already happened, maybe 
it's already gone and we're on the other side of it. You know, um, I'd imagine that NATO and Europe are going to be fed into a war after, um, after the flyby. But, um, you know, the whole aspect of why does Europe have to be fed into a war um, at this critical point? When we come around here and actually Hydra cuts across, which is going to be a bit later, it comes over here and I've stopped the module. But what will happen is that will come in much tighter and go out here. I'm of mind in kind of like August time. Um, in you know, it's going to be a big one this year. And this is when, you know, the Large Hadron Collider is about to, as we go into summer, as we go, as we go into the beginning of summer, that's when they're going to probably, around about, now, around about March, after this flyby is when they'll fire up the Large Hadron Collider, the biggest ever um, highest power collisions. And that will be, and then the war will be, um, unfortunately I haven't, you know, I haven't got that, I haven't, extended up to 2023 because I thought it was 2021 was going to be the biggest point if I'm honest you know at that point of this one and I thought this was a small one I thought this was you know but this is actually the big blue what we're calling the blue pacino or whatever else that is what's that's that's comes in August August Eve kind of time by all our you know the logical thing is that's going to be a big crowd crossing at that point that's when the doorway between the souls that are connected to the earth realm, the earth um, astral realms, those who are ready to go to this higher second earth that works in a much different fashion will transport at that point and the powers that be want to close that door to those beings. And keep them here, keep them locked into these astral realms. And make sure that Earth is used in a low vibrational activity so that only the lower astral activities. But this is just bringing it all in. This is bringing it all into the third dimension. And once all those energies are in the third dimension, then we'll. <clears throat> direct accountability will karmic accountability will begin for those beings for the first time and um, they will be experiencing humanity directly they will be utterly incarnate it will be them and any other aspect which has been highest aspect if they don't want to attune to that anymore. And it just it's it's basically a arrival point for all beings on this planet on a soul level. Whether you want to be your highest or whatever you want to be, there will be absolute clarity at that point. And when we get to this point here, this will be a massive transit point. Many of the souls that are leaving at that point and transferring to this world will go all together. Either this year or next year. We don't know truly the transit, but that will be, and we're certainly where it will be, whether it's this year, whether it's, whether it's next year. Many have done it already. Many of you are already there and have done this transit long before and are working with those beings that are coming in here at this time. But um, It's a crazy story. It's a crazy story, it's a big story, and I haven't got all the answers, and I'm throwing this together, and um, you know, I've put a date on on this to, to, to a degree, but I truly don't know what's going to happen here. You know, I'm expecting long duration volcanoes to begin in land up now. You know, or well, certainly some big volcanoes to go bang, and then to develop into long durations as we both track around together then. Earth and this twin tail object tracking together for some time. You know, that's what it's looking like is going to happen. You know, I'm imagining Vesuvius, I'm imagining all sorts. And we'll just 
just don't know. We just don't know until it happens, but we can see the patterns and charter those and make calculations based on those. And that's all I'm doing. That's all I'm doing is trying to make sense of this and the messages I was given when I wrote Laughing Gas and what was coming through and stuff to piece it all together. It's a big story there, people, and I just want to send you so much love, so much hope, and um, big golden rings of light protection at this time. Know that, you know, there's not everyone is going to see this, this journey. Every, all, all beings on this planet are divine. All beings are divine. We're all on an evolutionary pathway. And we're all, various different doors open for everyone at various different stages. Is a set of doors that are opening for those who want to operate on a specific boundary. That's all it is. It's not right or wrong, it's not good or bad. You know, at the end of this, this is not the end of badness on this earth. This is just bringing in absolute direct accountability. No more backseat drivers driving from the outside. All of these invaded astral realms are shutting up shop for a moment, literally a moment. And then they will begin anew. And anything that's existing in those astral realms cannot exist there during that time. And what's being done by a specific agenda is to accommodate those infinite beings, souls, spirits, trap souls, fallen mm -hmm. angels whatever you want to call it, they are coming into this realm through this process that's going on, not because of these planets, but because of other choices that are being made right now. And nothing is set in stone. You know, just a tiny window in this massive process. But, um, Gold rings of light, very powerful. Remember your intention. Think about are you trying to do anything bad to anyone out there? You know, what do you want? Are you just trying to fulfill your dreams of love and hope? And remember what you're doing here on this plane, trying to track your intentions back to a good place and send that message out to your to the provider of what brought you here. The grace that enabled you to incarnate in this body. And ask that mighty grace for protection through these times if you are. Uh, take care. So much love. Goodbye.